Welcome back, everyone. We're so pleased to have you with us for a very special opening keynote address by Peter Seligman, who's the founder and founding CEO of Neotero. So Neotero is a joint venture of the Emerson Collective, the MacArthur Foundation, the Malago Foundation, and Conservation International. Neotero works alongside indigenous people and local communities in securing their rights, cultures, and well-being through agreements that secure the vitality of their oceans and lands. For nearly 40 years, Peter has been an influential and inspiring voice in conservation. And for me personally, a senior colleague to whom I looked who really understood the systemic solutions that are needed and the different leverage points that we can reach for to make a difference. He began his career in 1976 with the Nature Conservancy, serving as the organization's Western region land steward, and later became the director of the California Nature Conservancy. He is chairman of the board and former CEO of Conservation International, a global nonprofit organization that he founded in 1987. Peter, we are so pleased to have you with us. Thank you so much for, for being here and spending your time with us and providing some insights into the wisdom and guardianship issues that you all work on every day. Welcome. Great. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to share my experiences and thoughts with such a diverse and very distinguished group of leaders. I know that we all wish we could be together. Um, so uh, um, just uh, know that uh, we share this concern for this, this terribly challenging and tragic moment that, that all of us are dealing with. Um, as I believe we all understand, we're in the age of Climate change is upon us and has already transformed the ecological systems and the processes that all life depends upon. In the Southern and Central Pacific, nations which depend upon tuna populations are seeing a movement of tuna migrations from the West to the East. And island nations such as the Solomons are losing tuna populations from migratory ships. Sorry, Peter, I just want to check. Did you have, um, your slides aren't showing, did we? We're gonna show them later. Okay, we're gonna, I apologize. We're going to bring them on as we go. I apologize. No problem. No problem. Uh, thank you, Amy. Um, so, as I was saying, you know, we're seeing migratory shifts of tuna populations from the west to the east, and island nations like the Solomons are losing tuna populations due to these shifts, but island nations such as the Cook Islands are gaining tuna populations. And as was reported just today uh, in the Washington Post, the uh, Arctic. Uh, uh, temperatures are at a point which has never been reached before and forest fires melting. We've never experienced this kind of heat in the far north. So uh, we're clearly at a point where we have to address these interconnected challenges of reducing CO2 emissions as rapidly as possible uh, or face radical ecological reactions uh, to moisture and temperature regimes which have devastating ecos devastating impacts on the ecological systems as well as the species that we are directly and indirectly connected to. This means today admitting that we are in an emergency situation that's going to require sacrifice as well as discomfort. We are also at the point where we have to understand that the natural world is the most important ally we have. Reducing CO2 emissions, reducing CO2 levels from fuel is clearly important and essential. But if we continue to destroy ecological systems through extraction and deforestation and agricultural frontiers and overfishing, we will not have done nearly enough. These natural systems are both our carbon sinks and the reservoirs for our resilience. Destruction of tropical forests, boreal forests, grasslands, salt marshes, mangroves, and soils contributes at least one third of the global carbon emissions. They are also the ecological machines that automatically through the process of photosynthesis capture CO2 from the atmosphere. And without concerted efforts to keep these ecological systems healthy and functioning, climate change will not be reduced or contained. There's more. These ecosystems are the homes to millions of species of life that we depend upon, 
In fact, species and the way they interact with each other are the engineers of ecosystems, the creators of ecosystems. Without them, the natural world that we depend upon for water, air, food production dies. And the nature and the beauty of nature is that each of these species has remarkable genetic variety. When one variety is unable to survive due to changes in its environment, there's a good chance that another one of the same species with slightly different genetics will be able to adapt and thrive. This is what has been occurring in the Pacific as ocean acidification has changed. Coral has died off only to be replaced by a different variety of coral, which has the ability to live in a new reality. Nature is a powerful and absolutely essential source of resilience. Ecosystems depend upon this resilience to continue to function, and we human beings depend upon this resilience for our own survival in the crisis that we call climate change. In 2017, when I resigned as the CEO of Conservation International, I joined with a few colleagues and friends to create a new organization, Neotero. Neotero is from the Esperanto language and translates as Our Earth. We launched this new organization as a direct response to important lessons that I have learned over the past years. At CI, we were committed to this concept that I've already mentioned, nature-based solutions. The simple idea that one-third of the climate mitigation solution lies in protecting ecological systems, and that ecological systems and their genetic variability are essential for adaptation to climate reality. What I learned in 2016 and 2017 was that one third of the earth is still under the guardianship of indigenous peoples. And that upon their territories, within their territories, are 40% of the intact ecosystems, 80% of global biodiversity, and one third of the earth's sequestered or secured carbon stocks. And as I was departing from CI, I began to explore with indigenous leaders such as Mernon Cunningham of Nicaragua, Vicky Corpus of the Philippines, Nainoa Thompson of Hawaii, the horrific story and history of colonization of indigenous peoples that was begun in the 15th century at the urging of the Pope. The Pope issued a papal bull, and in it he said that that commandment, thou shalt not kill, only applies to Christians, and that non-Christians were fair game. The result has been over the past 500 years a genocide across the Americas, Africa, and Asia of indigenous peoples. The story is horrific, and it is important for each of us to understand. I would recommend that you read a book called An Indigenous People's History of the United States by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, just as a starting point. In my conversations with my friends, we decided that although the world depended upon the health of the earth, the very peoples who understand the earth and have continued to protect their home territories were under assault, disrespected, and threatened. That's why we created Neotero, to work, to work alongside of indigenous peoples in their self-determined and self-defined commitments to secure both their cultures and their territories. What we learned was that all of the indigenous peoples, peoples we spoke with and listened to, shared a common idea, which we call reciprocity. It's a simple idea that is shared by all the indigenous cultures, but is absent in Western societies. Fundamentally, reciprocity is the idea that human beings and non-human beings depend upon each other and upon the health of the earth. It is a basic realization that all of nature is connected and interdependent and that there is a spirit that moves between us that must be loved and respected. When an animal is killed for food, this is a gift to the family. When a river brings fish, this is a gift. And all gifts must be respected and appreciated, and those that provide the gifts are to be thanked and revered. Again, I would recommend a book, this one by Robin Kimmerer, called Braiding Sweetgrass. Last year, I was with the Premier of Greenland and Iceland, shortly after President Trump indicated that he wanted to buy Greenland. I asked Premier Kilson how that offer played out. His response was that he thought it was a joke and did not take it seriously, because an Inuit cannot sell land. It's part of their identity and soul. 
It was like asking us to sell our mother, is the way he put it. So as we launched Neotero, we decided that we needed to be a different organization. We needed to be a polycultural organization, able to be trusted by indigenous partners as well as by non-indigenous states and non-indigenous partners. Our board has to be 50% indigenous and chaired by an indigenous person. And our staff needs to be 50% indigenous with their next CEO being an indigenous person. We also committed to intentionally ensuring that we explored and eliminated processes that continue the colonizing mentality, such as the white guy speaks first. We rotate who leads our leadership team meetings. We focus on listening to each other. We focus on creating comfortable spaces for all of our ter- team to be heard respectfully. Nia Taro is committed to working alongside of indigenous peoples. We have a relatively small staff of 30 who are distributed in skills and geography. Half of our team are indigenous with deep knowledge and high respect in the regions where they live. And half of our leaders and our virtual headquarters identify as indigenous. Our strategy has been to focus on big geographies. And, and maybe we can see the slide of these geographies where we're focusing now. First is the Central and Western Pacific Oceans. The second, the Northern Amazon. The third, the boreal forests of the Northwest. This slide is of the Northern Amazon, the Pacific follows, and the next slide is the boreal. Just to give you a sense of the scale of the boreal, in the Satu region, the Great Bear Lake is 300 miles across, and all of continental Europe can fit into this region that's called the Satu region. These large swaths of planet Earth are still relatively healthy and are under the guardianship of indigenous communities and cultures. They are all under siege from governments, extracted industries, and invasion. Our work is to support the indigenous organizations which are committed in their life plans, in their life strategies, to keep their homes and the beings they share their homes with healthy and vibrant. We support these communities in a range of ways. Protectors, protection of their borders, legal defense against the taking of their places, support of educational system, security of food, protection against health challenges like the present pandemic, COVID, development of ways to ensure long-term financial security through trust funds or enterprises. Let me touch upon a few examples. Shortly after we launched Neotero, a Brazilian friend, photographer Sebastian Salgado contacted me to tell me about a very remote valley in the northwestern corner of Brazil. It's on the right hand, it's on the left hand side of this map. It's called the Valle do Javari or the Javari Valley. Sebastian claimed that there were 10 uncontacted tribes in a roadless region the size of the nation of Portugal. In the late summer of 2018, I visited with some friends the valley. We learned that Salgado might have underestimated the indigenous communities which are uncontacted. We also learned that the Brazilian government was encouraging illegal invasions and that relatives of the uncontacted, who had made contact just in the past few years, were dying from malaria with 50% of their young people dying before the age of five and that they lived in fear. Neotero committed to supporting these communities and tribes. Over the past years, we have supported the creation of a new non-governmental organization led by the leaders of the recently contacted communities. This organization, which is called Unavaja, the organ has become a powerful force for the protection of indigenous rights. Two brothers stand out. One is a lawyer and the other, Beto, works with Neotero. They have succeeded in winning lawsuits against the government's efforts to bring evangelical Christians into the region. They have succeeded in a legal petition, the first heard by the Brazilian Supreme Court, that requires the government to uphold the constitutionally granted rights of indigenous peoples to their territories and to provide protection against invasions as well as against the pandemic. And in the past years, Neotero has begun financing the monitoring of the borders, the financing of security stations to control access, and the creation of COVID infirmaries 
as COVID is raging through these regions right now. The battle is ongoing, but there is hope where there had been none. Another example of our work is found in the Pacific. The Pacific Ocean is the largest ecoregion on Earth. All of the continents on Earth can fit into the Pacific Basin. It's 10% of the Earth's surface controlled by 16 island nations, all governed by a blend of formal and informal governments, with the vast majority of the leaders being indigenous to each of the islands. In the very western part of the Pacific, there's an island nation called the Solomons. The cultures are Melanesian, and their territories are rich in minerals, timber, and fish, all attractive to commercial interests. Our work has been to elevate a commitment that indigenous peoples have to what they refer to as sky islands, all elevations above 1,000 meters, densely forested, mineral-rich regions, which are the source of water, are rich in non-human beings or biodiversity, and where the spirits of their ancestors dwell. Working alongside of these indigenous communities and in collaboration with their leaders, we have created materials, we have provided materials, training, and support to their storytellers to create a groundswell of support for protecting the Sky Islands. The result, legislation that protects territories above 1,000 meters has passed, and we have begun the creation of a long-term trust fund to provide resources for the long-term guardianship of these Sky Islands. Excitedly for us, the success and inspiration has spread virally across the Pacific. Samoa, New Caledonia, Papua New Guinea, Vanuatu communities have begun demanding similar protection for their places and for their cultures. I think it might be worth it just to show you this very brief 30 second piece that was produced by the communities as a way of sharing in their own words and their own images the value and the importance of the Sky Islands. And this video, which is 30 seconds, is actually a much longer video. And this video through the coconut phone system has spread across the Pacific so that uh, other island nations are inspired. And could we just show this really short clip? Great. What you saw there was what the Sky Islands looked like. And those are the tops of the islands that spread across the Pacific Ocean. The opportunity to secure them is right now. And the power of communication and storytelling is lifting the voices and giving a chance to communities that have been under stress and threat before. So that's just one example of the work in the Pacific. But we also have another real advantage in that one of our board members is a man by the name of Justice Joe Williams. Joe, Justice Joe is how we refer to him, is one of the five Supreme Court justices in New Zealand. He is a Maori man and has been a key leader in the transformation of New Zealand's brand of British law. And what he has achieved is to include the Maori concept of kinship into British law. And that concept is that forests, mountains, and rivers are all related to humans in that they all share common ancestry. That's the mythology and the belief and the culture of the Maori. And as a result in New Zealand, rivers and mountains have attained legal standing, personhood, the right to a fair trial, and standing in the courts of law. We are working with Justice Joe, with Nainoa Thompson from the from Hawaii, one of the great wayfinders, and other leaders across the Pacific to ensure that the Pacific Ocean has kinship with its communities and the rights of restoration from damage, the right to remain untouched, the right to health. We are just beginning this initiative. It is picking up steam. It's an opportunity that if it shreds across the Pacific can benefit oceans all over the world. 
In addition to this idea of big geographies, Neotero focuses on what we call big wisdom. In collaboration with an indigenous organization called Pawanka, we're creating the Wayfinders Circle. This is a constellation of 10 indigenous communities spread across the earth who have succeeded in securing their culture, their connection to their place, and the boundaries of their territories. And these communities are prepared to share their wisdom with other indigenous peoples, as well as non-indigenous peoples. We have a chief storyteller at Neotero. Her name is Tracy Rector. She's a Choctaw woman, recently won an Emmy for her film, Heartland, whose responsibility is to support indigenous storytellers in telling their own story and to find the platforms for these stories to be heard. I want to share with you another piece. It's a little longer. It's about three minutes. But this piece was done. Uh, it's called In Our Own Voices. It was done at the the Big Sky Film Festival this past year, where we have brought storytellers from all across the world together, indigenous storytellers, to be able to share their videos, to share their work, and to have a platform to be heard. So it's a little longer than the other, but I think it's worthy of just hearing in their own words the power of storytelling and why we need to be listening. My goal is to be able to create a hero, create heroes that little Indian kids can look up to. Um, my goal is to do the impossible, and the impossible to me is write a story where the Indian actually wins because we don't have that. Being a filmmaker also is a challenge, but I find comfort in those challenges, yeah, because I don't think successful people can be successful without certain challenges. Because my ancestors have passed down so many of our stories orally, and a lot of our history wasn't written. And so for me, storytelling is really, really important.
I think we temporarily lost Peter. So we'll bring him back. Thank you so much. Glad folks were able to see the video, it looks like. And just while we're waiting, I wanted to encourage everybody to put questions into the chat. And as I mentioned in our welcome session, we also have the ability for folks to ask for the mic and we sort of virtually invite you on stage and you'll be on camera and you can ask that way or you can just put your question into the chat without asking for the mic. Uh, if we have time, we'll invite you up. Thank you very much. And I'm guessing Peter will be back with us any moment. Thanks, Julia. Me too. Just come back on video while we're waiting. I'm so pleased to have started out today with this and looking forward to the next conversation with Mitch and, and Nemontin and Kimo as well and their work in Ecuador, in the Amazon. Angela, I see uh, your note. We'll take a look and make sure. Um, oh, great. Good. Glad folks are overcoming the any technical issues. We like the run, run the world platform because it really provides the opportunity like the cocktail hour virtual networking where you get matched up one on one randomly. And so really encourage people to join that. So you'll be five minutes with one person and then you'll be matched with another for five minutes and another. So like the serendipity of being together in Sun Valley, we have that chance to meet each other in the hallways um, at receptions. And so we wanted to create that opportunity by using Run the World. Also, this opportunity to ask for the mic and come on stage, that's something we talked to Run the World about providing because um, we wanted to create that opportunity and they added it to the functionality of their conference platform. So really enjoyed working with them. So thank you so much for getting on board with a new platform. Little departure from our usual Zoom in this time of COVID. Let's see. Well, I'm hoping Peter will be back. Monique, I see you're still on. Do you have an update? Okay. All right. Well, I am going to, um, let's see. I think what I'd love to do is take the opportunity to share um, our, uh, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to share um, a couple slides with you guys to thank a few people who made this possible. Um, go through our welcome deck again with folks. And then as soon as I hear Peter, we will go back. So back to beginning. So really, I wanted to um, welcome everybody. Um, today is all about rebalancing the human relationship with nature, which is vital right now, as we know, in this time of COVID, racial justice, and climate crisis, nature is our best investment, our best ally, and we just need to invest in protecting and restoring nature. And today is providing all the different strategies for doing so, or at least to start indigenous guardianship to corporate and investment strategies, to experiential education, experiential learning strategies, to a discussion about the imperative for our security and how we need a natural security policy. We'll also have a political climate podcast interview uh, with the executive director of Wallace Global Fund, Ellen Dorsey. Ellen founded Divest Invest, which was a call to all investors to divest from fossil fuels and reinvest their funds in solutions to our climate crisis. So I'm really excited about that interview with Julia Piper, our friend from Political Climate, who's been with us on the stage at the forum over the last several years with her team interviewing people for their podcast. Um, we also have a panel on local to global, so really place-based resilience strategies from Costa Rica, Idaho, and Australia. Really looking forward to that conversation as well. So hope you guys can join us for the day. And as I said before, Really encourage folks to put questions into the chat. Uh, yep, Peter's having technical issues. That's from Monique letting us know. Um, so just going back to the slides. Um, thank you to our partners, American Farmland Trust. So on Tuesday, we had a fantastic session about 
about our food system, well-being in our food system. And Sean Shepard and the team from American Farmland Trust have been a real partner. We had a working session around a regenerative agriculture fund to get going here in Idaho with American Farmland Trust and Replant Capital, an investment firm that's raising $250 million to invest in regenerative practice on farms across the United States. Really excited about that. We have a lot of barley growing here in Idaho and hops and other, and you have Anheuser-Busch and Bev and General Mills and Danone all looking to source their crops from regenerative practices. So it's a, an exciting time where people are really getting on board to regenerate our soils rather than depleting our soils. So thank you to Sean and American Farmland Trust, Hawaii Tropical Bioreserve and Garden, Dan Litkin House. We're going to hear from him and his colleagues on a place-based experience. Okay. Entity. All right, Peter's back. Thank you, Peter. So glad that you're back. All right, let me uh, just get back. <laughs> Back out, I'll stop my slides and welcome back. I'm so sorry. This is okay. a, so I've got certain benefits as an elder and <laughs> certain serious handicaps as an elder. <laughs> so, not just elders. Okay, okay. Well, what I was trying to say, what I wanted to, you know, the video that you saw a few minutes ago, um, really, it just you know, in an effort to figure out how do we amplify the voices of indigenous peoples. And I think that that's something that's really crucial and important for all of us who are concerned with environmental health and for the standing of this planet and for the communities and the, 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 the relationship that we have with nature, just to be able to listen. Um, you know, when you look at, at, uh, at, at the, at the history of the North American and even the global environmental movement, um, there has been a truly unfortunate uh, 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 relationship between the invasion and the taking of territories and the North American conservation movement, uh, the global conservation movement. You know, in fact, you know, we, we, we that have been in the environmental movement for decades, we, we really hail and, and have always recognized and, ex and, and, and uh, extolled President Teddy Roosevelt as being one of the great conservation heroes. Yet Teddy Roosevelt referred to Native Americans as squalid savages. So you can understand why there's this strong distrust between indigenous peoples and the Western environmental movement. And our responsibility is to actually regain that trust and and that takes really an acknowledgement that that uh, to have trust you got to earn trust, and to earn trust you got to listen, and we have to really be willing to 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 study what has happened because the simple truth is that that there is a powerful opportunity between the environmental movement and indigenous peoples to collaborate. We all share and cherish love of the earth. But we need to also begin to acknowledge that terrible things have happened during the last centuries in the name of conservation, but really in the name of colonization. And so as I've been learning over these decades that I've been involved in, been involved in the environmental movement, I've been learning that, that it's absolutely essential for us to have the bravery and the honesty to, to listen to indigenous peoples to understand their story, to acknowledge the pain that has been caused and the role that we have played. And I've also learned over time that it's very, very important that we recognize that, that there is a need for reparation. And I don't mean a reparation necessarily in a dollar amount given to different people, but I think just a recognition that our systems have to be improved and have to be transformed. And and that's tough to do because, because we're not used to having that kind of humility. But we, ha we need to have that. We need acknowledgement. We need reparation that is in the form of giving back and listening and respecting indigenous voices and peoples. And we also need to have mutual forgiveness. That really is kind of essential. And there's some books that I really recommend that all of us look at as we continue this journey. And books include, for example, Decolonizing Wealth 
by Edgar Villanueva, which is a powerful and strong book. Another really useful book is a book by a woman named Sherry Mitchell, and it's called Sacred Instructions. I believe that all of us that are involved in the challenge of sustainability need to recognize that there is no way to proceed successfully if we don't elevate our ability to hear and listen to the cultures of indigenous peoples and embrace this simple idea of reciprocity. That simple idea that all beings, human and non-human, depend upon each other. And if we can get there, we can begin to shape the way we, we care for and cherish this place. We can begin to acknowledge the wisdom of indigenous cultures that have had such resilience and have such a strength and an ability to, to, to remember and to rekindle their ideas about how this place operates. And I believe deeply that if we can embed some of their deep understanding of reciprocity into the thoughtfulness with which we look at our systems of governance, of markets, of economies, and if we can make reciprocity a core part of that, we actually stand a chance of getting out of the holes that we've dug ourselves into. And so the way I look at it now, and it's something I've learned, and I did not know this, is that we need to elevate indigenous communities for what they have done, for their strength, and for the leadership they can provide to all of us. So how we amplify their voices and their knowledge is really something that all of us need to be thinking about. Who are the storytellers? What are the stories? What are the platforms that we have to build? And then how do we make certain that non-Indigenous peoples can learn to hear? Because that's really the challenge that we face. So, you know, in a conclusion, and this story can go on and on and on, I, I just want to, to really end by saying that concepts of kinship, concepts of reciprocity are really essential and powerful forces that can transform the relationship between humanity and the earth. And if we can get there, we've got a chance of getting out of the deep chasm that we've crawled into. And I thank you, Amy, for allowing me to speak and for sharing this particular journey that I've had from, from the beginning of my career working on conservation to this place now where, where uh, I have become an elder and have recognized that I've got much, much more to learn. So thank you so much for this. And I'm happy to answer questions or if we have time or you'd like me to. We have a few minutes. Thank you so much, Peter, and um, really for sharing your insights and long experience and more recent learnings now. I'm so excited that this is your focus and you continue to contribute to lead and to show us a better way. I, I have, we did see a question in the audience um, from Tony Evans. Tony is actually a, a wonderful local um, writer and reporter um, here in the Sun Valley area. And um, Tony, did you, if you want the mic and know how to ask for the mic, feel free to. I was going to pass it over to you to ask your question live. Um, if not, I'll go ahead and share it with Peter. I'll wait a sec. If not, all right. So Tony's question was, how and where are indigenous communities in the American West leading conservation efforts? Are there examples in our state of Idaho? So Peter, I don't know, yeah, about your work in North America, but go ahead. Yeah, so I, I do not know much about uh, the leadership in Idaho. I'm sure it's there. I'm sure it's there. Uh, most of the work that we are doing in North America right now is with uh, the Blackfeet, and it's in Montana. And mm -hmm. it's, it's what we're seeing there as well is a resurgence of, of uh, connection to the past and efforts by uh, Blackfeet communities to to rekindle their celebration, to rekindle the knowledge about the bundles and the magic, uh, and really a commitment to, to uh, uh, inspire their young people to learn about where they came from, 
to relearn their language, to relearn their culture, to to uh, to remember their place. Uh, and there's some major efforts in Montana now for the restoration of the the, the traditional and historic uh, bison economies. So you know that we're doing a lot of work in that region. You can also see in northwestern Canada with. Uh, the Hiltzuk and the Heisla nations on the coast of British Columbia, enormous progress. Uh, these are communities that never signed peace treaties. And because they did not sign peace treaties and agreed to go to reservations, the courts of Canada have recently upheld that they still have control and ownership of their traditional territories. And they are demonstrating by the way they manage and care for their territories, this traditional concept of reciprocity, um, they are looking at the uh, the resurgence of their, their wildlife populations. They're rebuilding their cultures. They're rebuilding their language. And they're showing the world a different pathway towards actually the, 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 the regeneration of the health of the earth. Thank you, Peter. We had a number of comments who were endorsing the concept in New Zealand of providing those rights to nature. And so a number of folks saying in the U.S. asking, you know, could we build on that um, learning from New Zealand? Have you, Has your organization or others you work with looked at this opportunity within the United States or other nations if they're pursuing similar strategies? Yes. So there are other nations pursuing this strategy. The government of Ecuador actually has actually had their legal system transformed to be able to think about some of these ideas. And we might hear about that a little later. Mm -hmm. um, um, but I would say that there's an organization that, that we have become connected to. And in fact, we are working with them because, as I said earlier, Neotaro is trying to retain a very small team. So, um, you know, when I started CI, we built an organization with 1,300 people. Neotero, we've got 30. Uh, it's much easier to manage, by the way. Um, uh, but there's a group here called the, 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 the Center for Earth Law. And I suggest you check in with them. It's a phenomenal organization. And they are looking at, at the legal opportunities, legal challenges for elevating um, uh, the rights of the earth, the rights of nature, and how that fits into the legal structure. And I really endorse them and think that they're a great organization. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Peter. We had some other comments. Monique had put those books into the chat. So thank you, Monique. Um, and then a couple of our other friends, uh, Wendell and Holland and others have been adding other books into this list. And so um, including a People, uh, Indigenous Peoples History of the United States, another one that Monique had mentioned. So really appreciate the resources um, so that we can all take this and move forward and Edgar V and the way of his work, of course. So thank you very much for joining us today. And actually, um, and thank you for sharing this and spending this hour with us. It's been um, a wonderful way to kick off our day. And of course, Peter is gonna be staying with us for our next session. We. Um, we're so pleased that Peter is actually working with our friends, uh, Mitch Anderson and Namonte Nkimo, Amazon Frontlines and the Sabo Alliance and their work in the Ecuadorian Amazon. So we're going to say goodbye and leave this session and we'll all join the next session on the Run the World platform. So we'll be back in literally two minutes. So come right back. Thanks, everyone. And thank you, Peter, very much. Thank you. Thank you.